The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Winter weather is coming. A freeze warning is in effect for South Texas tonight and the hill country with a lot of people expected to get their first freeze of the year. So how cold is it going to get and how long will it last? Adam Kasky will have all those details for us coming up in just a few minutes. A driver accused in a bizarre suicide attempt last summer in court today, asking for a reduction in his half million dollar bond. Colby Burke facing murder charges, accused of deliberately crashing his Jeep head on into a car, killing a passenger in that vehicle. Paul Venema with a defense argument for reducing that bond and the judge's decision. Last summer, 26-year-old Colby Burke's Jeep suddenly veered into oncoming traffic on Babcock Road and crashed head-on into a sedan, killing 19-year-old Savannah Macy Ramos and injuring two others. The car burst into flames following the crash. Burke was not seriously hurt and he fled on foot. When he was caught by police soon after the crash, he told officers that he was trying to kill himself. Well, he was a very high-functioning uh, very intelligent uh, young man. Burke's father, testifying via Zoom during a bond reduction hearing, explained that his son had experienced what he called a psychiatric breakdown that day. Colby uh, started a new medication about a month ago, uh, I believe four weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. And it seems to have really helped him. Burke's lawyer said that his client is being evaluated by a psychiatrist and asked that bond be reduced to $175,000 so that the evaluation could continue. I'm not convinced that um, he's not going to get in a car and do it again. I'm not convinced. And so at this point, I'm going to deny the motion to reduce bond. Meza said that she would be willing to reconsider the motion at a later date following additional evaluation of Burke. Paul Venema, Case at 12 News. Drug maker Moderna has requested emergency use authorization from the Food and Drug Administration for its own COVID-19 vaccine. This follows Pfizer's vaccine request, increasing the possibility that doses of the new preventative treatments will soon reach San Antonio earlier than rather than later. Ursula Perry with what that could mean and why the technology involved in this is revolutionary. Over the holiday weekend, nearly 2,500 new cases of coronavirus were reported in Bear County. Nationwide, records are breaking as well. More than 93,000 hospitalized and more than 130,000 people testing positive on Sunday alone. I, I truly believe that the next six to 12 weeks are going to be the darkest weeks in modern Amer American medical history. Dr. Varone worked his 252nd day in a row on Thanksgiving. As hospitals here in major Texas cities struggle, the news of a second vaccine going after FDA approval offers reason to celebrate. Both vaccines working 90 to 95 percent to stop COVID spike protein. So by giving the ability for our cells essentially to become little factories and make the spike protein without actually having the infection, we're mimic the, mimicking the infection and allowing the immune system to essentially become trained um, to start making antibodies. One difference between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines is how they are stored. The Pfizer vaccine needs specialized freezer storage, whereas the Moderna one, can use a regular freezer and even be refrigerated. As for when we're going to get these vaccines here in San Antonio, it could be as early as next week. We are still awaiting, again, FDA approval. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. And coming up tomorrow at 6, Ursula finds out from an infectious disease specialist at University Hospital about how the vaccine will reach San Antonio and what you should expect to do in the coming weeks. For the public, COVID-19 vaccines can't come soon enough. The same holds true for doctors and nurses and others who are trying to help the patients who depend on them. But there's also another type of help on the way. Medical and nursing schools around the nation will soon be graduating the next generation of health professionals. Jesse Degollado spoke with two of them, a future nurse and physician at UT Health San Antonio. The little boy, proudly standing in front of his father, the geologist, is about to graduate from medical school at UT Health San Antonio. My dad, he was the big science guy. He was, granted, it was all about rocks, right? But it's where his love of science and medicine began, never thinking he could someday confront what doctors and nurses are dealing with nonstop. 
I think that we all have a drive to bear witness to this pandemic, to kind of see it for what it is and to help out in the best way we can. Is there a point that some of you have asked yourself, what are we getting ourselves into? Physician burnout is very real. It was real before the pandemic. The same could be said about nurses who are overworked as well. Even so... Personally, um, wherever you need me, you know, I will be. And if it ends up being a COVID unit, um, then that's where life takes me. Nieto says exhausted nurses may not feel like heroes right now up against a viral enemy, but they are. And COVID didn't scare them away. You know, they're actually running towards um, towards it. She and the medical students soon to embark on his residency say they and their peers are up to the challenge that awaits. The younger generation of doctors is watching, whether they know it or not, that we're learning from you and that we hope to, in a couple years, be like you. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at time saver traffic right now. The train's got camera here at 281 in Loop 410. This busy interchange. This is uh, headed westbound here on this interchange. You can see traffic there uh, on the interchange itself up top, as well as the main lanes of 410 below. Very slow going at this hour. New at six, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night. None of that is said to stop the U.S. Postal Service. One San Antonio mailman is calling it quits after 30 years. For 28 of them, Marcus Perez has been delivering to the West Side Collins Garden neighborhood. Sarah Acosta spoke with neighbors who want him to know that he is loved and he will be missed. Mailbox after mailbox and thousands of letters and packages, along with friendly waves and hellos. You are up. Marcos Perez is making his final deliveries for the United States Postal Service today as he heads into retirement after 30 years. And 28 of those years have been spent in the West Side neighborhood, Collins Garden. And he has gotten to know almost all 650 residents he delivers to. So as he walks his final route like any other day, Yay. Residents cheering him on and telling him that they love him. Thank you, man. It's emotional. Marcos is just one mailman that touches everyone's heart. Consistency, he's always been real personable. He walks eight to nine miles a day delivering mail, even in the worst conditions. We're like Saturday. Saturday was a rough day because it rained all day. There was no dry spot on your body. But when asked what made him stay, I fell in love with the people. I love you. Love you. Several neighbors have put out signs, messages, and balloons letting him know, thank you for your service. Thank you for, uh, for being so uh, for nice to me. And his advice for future USPS postal workers? Give the service you're supposed to give. Okay, that's, what we're, that's what the United States Postal Service is meant to do, provide service. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Congratulations on your retirement. The other big story we are talking about today, of course, is the weather. We are expecting a big drop in temperatures with a hard freeze tonight. And many homeless people will be turning to shelters for help. But, but the coronavirus pandemic adding another level of difficulty due to social distancing guidelines. The Salvation Army can only fill about half of their beds. Brad Mayhar, a spokesperson for the organization, says the building lobby could normally be used in emergency situations. But even that option is off limits now because of COVID. We're expected to be at capacity again. Uh, we were actually at capacity last night. We can offer them a blanket, but they have to take it with them since we don't have the proper way to socially distance overflow traffic. Mayhar says turning anyone away is the last thing they want to do, but due to the pandemic, it may be what they have to do. And we've got some serious temperatures headed our way. Winter weather really making its presence known here, Adam. So how cold are we talking? Well, I think we'll get into the upper 20s in some parts of our viewing area. And I'll break that all down for you, show you exactly what we're expecting and where in a moment. First, today we started at 40, made it up to 58. Tomorrow morning's going to be cooler. 
but the afternoon will be a little bit warmer. The irony, right? Freeze warning in effect from 10 p.m. until 9 a.m. for the entire case at 12 viewing area. This is the vast majority of South Texas that is expecting our first freeze later tonight. I know parts of the hill country have hit freezing, but the majority of us have not yet this year, so this will be our first. Holotus now down to 52, 50 in New Braunfels, 46 already in Comfort, 51 Pleasanton and Stinson. 40s in the hill country, 50s for the most part elsewhere. That's now. Temperatures falling off quickly this evening. By 10 o'clock, we'll be near 40 degrees. I think 11 o'clock in the upper 30s. Clear sky, calm wind, dry air, good radiational cooling. So check this out. Tomorrow morning, we're expecting about four hours of a freeze. 29 Uvalde, 28 Hondo. 29 New Braunfels and even 29 in Pleasanton, some mid 20s for most of the hill country. And you look closer to Bear County here, and I think we'll be right around the 30 degree mark, give or take a degree or two. Stone Oak 29, Lavernia 29, and as cool as 26 tomorrow morning in Bernie. So we'll be feeling the chill just for the early morning hours. So have take the necessary precautions, especially for the pets and plants this time around. Pipes probably not going to be really at risk unless you're in an exceptional situation where they're uh, exposed more than usual. Light freeze tonight, low 60s by tomorrow afternoon, a lot of sunshine, but unseasonably cool all week. We'll talk about those details coming right up. All right, just about time now for the daily briefing on COVID-19 cases in our area. The first since last Wednesday, there were no briefings over the Thanksgiving holiday uh, since the mayor imposed that curfew. Let's go now to City Hall. Tonight we're reporting 1,117 new cases of COVID-19, bringing our total to 81,174 since the pandemic began. Our seven-day moving average now is 832. For context, the daily average was approximately 200 at the start of the month, so it has increased steadily as this uh, transmission has increased in this community. Fortunately, there are no new deaths to report tonight. However, our daily COVID hospitalizations, ICU visits, and ventilator uh, needs continue to trend up steadily. We have eight, excuse me, we have 587 COVID-19 patients in the hospital tonight, which is up five from yesterday and 39 from Saturday. We have 182 patients in the ICU and 800, excuse me, 99 patients uh, on ventilators this evening. That's 182 on the ICU and 99 on ventilators. Turning to our community's blood supply, uh, today we are close to a three-day supply in terms of our total inventory. The minimum required to meet the needs of hospital patients. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is working to reach a seven day supply, which is considered adequate. However, the inventory of type O blood, which is used in emergencies, is still critical at only a one day supply. This means that the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center can, can immediately only fill about half of the orders hospitals place for type O blood, which essentially puts trauma patients at risk. If you're able, will you please step up and donate blood for patients in our our community. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center has six donor rooms in this area. You can make an appointment to donate at southtexasblood.org or schedule to give blood at University Hospital 210-358-2812. Before I turn it over to the judge, it's Monday, so let's take a look at the progress and warning indicators. The number of cases per 100,000 is in the orange, which is severe. The positivity rate actually went down slightly from 10% to 9.2% but it remains in the orange severe category. We believe that the decrease in positivity rate is likely due to the large number of people who were not symptomatic but still got tested before the holiday weekend. More testing is good. Hospital stress is still hovering in the moderate phase and overall the risk level in our community has gone from light green to yellow which means we are going to a uh, category called worsening uh, and we've got to keep that uh, in mind given the in continued increase in cases. As a result, the Metro Health Department is issuing uh, some guidance today. I'll turn it to uh, Dr. Curian after uh, Judge Wolf gives his update. Uh, Judge yeah, Wolf? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And let me, first of all, uh, thank everybody for taking the necessary precautions over the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, from the information I've been able to gather and from uh, talking with friends and everybody else, I really, really think uh, that everybody was, was very careful. Uh, and we're crossing our fingers that that will show up. We won't know that 
uh, to probably within 10 days or so after the Thanksgiving weekend how well we did. But um, I just have a good sense that everybody was uh, taking the precautions and doing what they needed to do to get us through this uh, very, very hard period of time. Uh, we're continuing to watch the hospital numbers uh, closely. Uh, we're still carrying over 76 uh, patients from, um, from El Paso. That's, that's a significant, that's about, uh, what's that, about 15% about of the patients that are in our hospital are coming from, uh, from uh, El Paso. So that's put a little additional strain on the hospital, uh, clocking us in now at about 15% capacity uh, in terms of, the, uh, of COVID patients. Uh, but uh, we're not spiking. Uh, we need to remember while we have a, a continuing problem, it's not uh, like what we had in the summer. We had 1,267 people in the hospital, I believe it was on July the 13th. So uh, we're, we're, we're watching those numbers closely. That 9.2% um, uh, uh, <laughs> positivity rate uh, was certainly a, a, a step in the right direction now. It's always a question, how many people are you testing that are asymptomatic as opposed to those that have uh, symptoms? You test all symptoms, you're gonna get a higher, higher uh, positive rate. Test all asymptomatic, you're gonna get a lower one. For example, in our jail, uh, they're mostly all asymptomatic when they come in and it runs anywhere from one to 3% uh, of, of, of uh, COVID uh, uh, symptoms. So. So it depends on what the mix is. We probably did have a little bit more asymptomatic people that were getting tested, but let's cross our fingers and hope that um, next week holds up okay. Great. Thank you, Judge. And before we go to questions, let me turn it over uh, to Dr. Anita Curian with some additional guidance for our community. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as the mayor mentioned, all right, some good news and some bad in the daily briefing today. The good news, the positivity rate is declined just a little bit from last week, from 10% to now 9.2%. However, you heard the mayor and the judge there saying that they think that might be due to more people who were asymptomatic being tested prior to the Thanksgiving holiday. Also good news, no new deaths to report either. However, the risk level for San Antonio and Bear County is considered worsening when it comes uh, to the risk of getting COVID-19 throughout our community. And we saw cases today, new cases go above 1,000. Again, we did not see that over the weekend when they released numbers. Today, uh, 1,117 new cases. Uh, still 587 people in the hospital, 182 in the ICU, and 99 on, 99 on ventilators. And 67 of those, or 76 of those patients are from El Paso that are still being treated here in local hospitals. And something to give uh, some perspective here, that seven-day moving average we always talk about, they always give us the update on, it's now 832 cases on average per 24 hours. That number was roughly around 200 at the beginning of the month. So we've certainly climbed quite a bit uh, in these last 30 days or so. Uh, another update to the blood supply. The mayor and county judge were talking a lot about that last week, how uh, blood supply levels were uh, in dire need last week. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, they're up to a three-day supply, but that's still the minimum. They're right. trying to get that up to a seven-day supply, which is what is really needed uh, to help out those in need, those critical patients. So you can uh, donate. You can set up an appointment, of course, because of COVID. So SouthTexasBlood.org to set up an appointment uh, for life-saving help that is certainly needed. Give if you can. Let's check in with Adam on that big freeze that is coming our way. Yeah. First freeze of the season, actually coming right on average. Usually it's right at the end of November or in the first few days of December. Here we are, November 30th, and our first freeze will be later on tonight. Take a look at the readings across the state. We're all in a similar situation. Widespread 40s, some of us hanging on to 50s. 57 Del Rio, Brownsville 55, 52 in San Antonio, and already 46 in Carrizo Springs. So we fast forward to tomorrow morning, and we're expecting temperatures anywhere from about mid 20s in the hill country to about 28 to 32 degrees elsewhere. So outside of the hill country, you could be as cool as about 28 degrees or right at the freezing point of 32, such as Del Rio, 29 Pleasanton, 31 Catula, 29 New Braunfels for the low temperature. And I'm anticipating these sub freezing temperatures for about four hours later on tonight. So take the necessary precautions, particularly with the sensitive vegetation and the pets tonight. I said before, Pipes probably not really an issue here. We're not looking at a hard freeze. 30 degrees tomorrow morning. Look at our morning temperatures Wednesday back in the 40s. Still jacket weather, 
but then we cool off again. It will be down near freezing again toward the end of the work week. So this isn't going away right now, and it's going to be unseasonably cool all week long, running below average until we get to this upcoming weekend. Quiet weather, though, too. A lot of sunshine. I mean, all day today and all day tomorrow. Well, good radiational cooling tonight. But look at this cool air being pulled southward with this upper level low. And we have snow as far south as northern Alabama this evening. How's that? Just shows you how far south that cold air is reaching. 30 in the morning, sunny and 62 by the afternoon. High temperatures will be in the 60s again on Wednesday. But look at that Thursday and Friday, even cooler mornings in the 30s, afternoons only in the 50s. Cool week ahead. Thanks. Adam. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. And a local Longhorn is deciding to opt out, Greg. Yeah, this is not good news when it comes to the Longhorns future, especially this season. There's no indication he's going to return for his senior season either. He's just a junior. When we come back, we're talking about steel star Caden Stearns, who was the freshman of the year. Remember that for the Big 12. Now he is not returning for the rest of this season. What is his future? We'll discuss that. And what's next for UTSA after their regular season comes to a great ending coming up. Former Steel star Caden Stearns is opting out of the remainder of this season and possibly next. The breaking news delivered by Inside Texas tonight that says it is unclear if Stearns would return next season or declare early entry for the NFL draft. This comes over the fact that the best horns it could do this season is seven regular season wins if they went out against Kansas State in Kansas. It comes off their disappointing 23 to 20 loss to Iowa State that knocked them out of a chance at the Big 12 title. Now the question is, will Athletic Director Chris Del Conte fire Tom Herman, who has failed to win the Big 12 title in four years and eat his 15 and a half million dollar buyout and can he land urban meyer who retired from ohio state in 2018 with health issues during his weekly press conference today herman is not acting like a coach who's on the hot seat saying del conte has offered to contact recruits as if he will be their head coach next year that offer still stands uh as per uh, our last conversation this weekend and um, he knows as well as i do that uh, the main focus uh, needs to be on preparing uh, to beat Kansas State in Manhattan. Kickoff for the Horns game against Kansas State is set for 11 a.m. this Saturday in Manhattan. The UTSA Roadrunners are wrapped up their regular season with a 7-4 record. Now wait to see what is next. They could play for the Conference USA Championship since they are still leading the West Division, plus a bowl game. Early speculation has the Roadrunners possibly being invited to play in the New Mexico Bowl, which is this season due to the COVID-19 pandemic will be played in Frisco, Texas. But what is truly remarkable is that the Roadrunners were able to get in 11 games, buying into first-year head coach Jeff Trailer's enthusiasm, discipline, and toughness. The first seven-win season since Larry Coker was a head coach in 2013, and they finished with their best game of the year, a 49-17 route of North Texas ending a three-game losing streak to the Mean Green. In that game, former Jetson running back Sincere McCormick regained the title of leading rusher in the nation with a 251-yard performance and two touchdowns, the first 200-plus-yard performance in UTSA football history. I watch him every day. He, he shows up every day and works his tail off. He's yes, sir, no, sir. First one to the meetings, last one to leave. Uh, we, we, we've got great culture, I and mean, he, he's one of the leaders of that. And it uh, doesn't surprise me at all. Our line and tight ends and receivers, our quarterback carrying out fakes, those quarterback runs help him too now. Frank pulling that ball and going out the other way, they got to all be worried about Frank. So it's great complimentary team football. Fighting Texas Aggies remain number five in the nation, according to the latest Associated Press College football poll. Even though they struggled offensively against the defending national champs in their 20-7 victory over LSU on Saturday night. In that game, San Antonio's Kellen Mond struggled after a three-week layoff due to the COVID-19 pandemic, completing only 32% of his passes and no touchdowns. So it would be up to the defense and special teams to come through, and they did, forcing three big turnovers. Buddy Johnson has been named the SEC's Defensive Player of the Week after he intercepted this pass in the third quarter, returned it for a 15-yard touchdown to seal the Aggies his victory. Johnson, along with former Judson standout, DeBarvin Leal, limited the Tigers to just 36 yards rushing. Leal was named the SEC's Defensive Lineman of the Week after he came up with a career-high seven tackles. It means a lot to us, you know, like I say, we want to, we've been trying to find our identity. I think we're doing a great job of doing it, but, you know, we, we're not uh, worried about rankings right now. You know, we're focusing on, on what we can control, and, you know, we're fired up. We're ready to go back to practice today, you know, see what the game plan is. Up next are the Aggies, who are now 6-1 and one on the second, is on the road uh, against Auburn Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, interesting side note, the NFL has delayed the Steelers-Ravens game now until Wednesday because the players said they didn't want to play on Tuesday for fear of COVID.
Ah. <laughs> Keeps getting worse. It does. Thank you, Greg. Not a side note at all, though. Greg Simmons, 40 years <laughs> at KSAT today. You mentioned it at 5. We have to talk about it at 6. Yeah. My pleasure. 40 years today. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Greg. Thank you. Been a dream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be right back. The uncertainty surrounding COVID-19, especially when it comes to potential long-lasting effects of this illness, certainly one of the biggest challenges of living in this coronavirus world. But science researchers, uh, they're learning new information all the time. And among them, Dr. Monica Verdusco Gutierrez, who we want to bring in now for our KSAT Q&A. You are with the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at UT Health San Antonio. Thanks so much, first of all, for being here. Uh, you have a really interesting role there. You've developed a post-COVID COVID recovery clinic looking at some of these long lasting effects. So what are some of the long term uh, impacts of COVID that you're seeing? What we've been seeing in our clinic, we have patients that even though they've gotten over the acute part of COVID and they may be negative from their test, they will have ongoing symptoms for weeks, sometimes even months. And this includes fatigue, Dyspnea, I mean shortness of breath. They can't do the activities they were doing before. They may have pain syndromes. They may have a lot of neck pain and headaches. They may have a difficulty with concentrating or what they're calling brain fog. And this is just a handful of the multitude of symptoms. Patients may also have sometimes an autonomic dysfunction or a dysautonomia, which means that they'll have fluctuations in their heart rate and their blood pressure and their temperature. And this is something that is really affecting a good amount of the patients. Doctor, how long has the clinic been open now and operating and what have you learned about the virus and how is this helping us learn more in general about how COVID-19 affects us in the long haulers so that they call the people who have these effects? So the clinic's been going on at least two to three months. We have two clinics that are running right now. And believe, unfortunately, it was one that I would hope eventually would go out of business. But right now, it's so full that it's even some patients have to wait until February to get in to see a physician in the clinic. That's how prevalent these symptoms are for the long hauler patients or those who are suffering with post-acute COVID-19. What we happen to be learning is we're starting to see, well, what I see every patient's different everyone has a different story, but it's important to listen to everyone's story and to figure out what their symptoms are so that we can get to treating each of those different long-term symptoms. And the other thing, since it has been going on a couple months, we have seen already patients starting to improve and get better. Are you noticing any common traits between patients who have these longer lasting effects, whether it be their age or uh, gender or uh, blood type? I mean, anything that you see as a common trait? So I think there's more and more studies that are coming out on what these patients with long-term post-acute COVID have. And some of those, when they followed them on data tracking apps and monitoring is if they had initially symptoms and multiple symptoms at the beginning, these may be ones who may likely to have ongoing symptoms, even if they weren't hospitalized. And the other thing we're seeing is sometimes women are having some of the more long-term effects of COVID-19. And it isn't just people who are hospitalized. It could be patients who were suffering at home or who are sick, or maybe didn't even have a very serious response. The other thing is we definitely need more research. We don't have all the lab data tests for some of these long hauler patients yet. I mean, some stuff, if they were hospitalized and their lungs were definitely damaged, that we know. And then there's patients that we just don't have the lab tests yet to uh, be able to exactly follow, you know, what happened, what went wrong, and we're still learning more. Every patient's different. Everyone experiences this disease differently. What are you seeing is the most common thing that people are experiencing as they come into your, your rehab facility, the clinic? I think what we're seeing the most is definitely fatigue, difficulty getting back to their activities that they were doing before. This, there's patients who may have been big runners, running half marathons, who can't even go up stairs anymore. We have patients who had problems sleeping, I still have problems sleeping, whose heart rate goes up very easily. They may just 
walk across the room and their heart rate goes up. They feel very short of breath when they try to do anything. Sometimes I'll just have a patient sit and stand a couple of times and that takes all their breath away. And then also some memory issues, trying to find words, they can have difficulty with that as well, as long as well as different pain syndromes. So it's, again, very different, but those are very much things that I hear in some of the long-term patients. You've talked a lot about the physical side effects, but you're saying you're seeing that you are also saying seeing mental health uh, impacts as well from COVID. Definitely. So when we see the patients, we do a very systematic screening about you know how did the disease affect them, and then also we look and look and see did they have something related to depression, anxiety, and a lot of them, believe it or not, have some post-traumatic stress disorder from going through COVID-19. Whether they were hospitalized or not, we're seeing this, and it makes us realize we also have to treat the mental health aspect as well as you know the physical aspect so many different components of just the research that goes into what we're learning every single day uh, about this pandemic. Dr. Monica Verduzco Gutierrez, as always, thanks so much for your time and uh, good luck with the clinic. I hope that it produces some great information for us all to learn from. Yes, thank you all, good night. Thank you, doctor. Take care, we'll be right back. Airports around America, the busiest they've been since the pandemic began. According to the Transportation Security Administration, nearly 1.2 million people passed through airport security on Sunday, the busiest flying day since March. But that was still just 41% of the number of people screened by TSA on the same day last year. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advising against Thanksgiving travel, fearing that family gatherings would only spread the virus. No one will be sorry to see the end of the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season come to an end. It started early this year on May 14th, more than two weeks before the season officially began. The head of the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration says the season broke records across the board. A record 12 named storms made landfall across seven states. There were 30 named storms in all, more than we have in the alphabet to name them. For just the second time, all the predetermined names were used, so the Hurricane Center started using Greek letters of the alphabet. Six storms reached major hurricane status. For the first time in recorded history, two major hurricanes formed in just the month of November. What a season. I'm glad to see it end so I can imagine how people along the Gulf Coast, Louisiana in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They had a double whammy of a four and a two in uh, Louisiana. The Gulf Coast line in general had a lot of landfalls, even if it was just a a weaker storm, still had an impact. And that's what we saw this year. Record Record breaking season in terms of the number, but not in terms of costliest. It wasn't the most expensive season we've had. And now they're, by the way, naming subtropical storms and whatnot, all this stuff. So the convention has changed a little bit. Let's put it that way in the criteria. Anyway, 52 degrees outside right now. Big story here. Temperatures falling quickly. By midnight, we'll be in the upper 30s. Prepare for a freeze tomorrow morning. Talk about that and let you know how cold it's going to get coming right up. All right, first freeze on the way. Is that right, Adam? That's right. Now, parts of the Hill Country have seen some freezing conditions here over the past couple of weeks, but this is a widespread freeze where we think it's going to affect every corner of the KSAT 12 viewing area. It's going to be fall-like and I guess you could say a little winter-like all week long. Sunny and dry. It's a good thing we got that rainfall after Thanksgiving. We needed it. We got it and it's a dry pattern this week and our first freeze. It's coming tonight. I think by about 3, 4 a.m. here in San Antonio, we should see temperatures a little below freezing. So let's take a look at our freeze warning. It's everybody out there. All the counties in blue. That includes the entire KSAT 12 viewing area. And this is right on par with a typical season. I mean, our average first freeze is November 30th. Look at that. It is November 30th tonight and Tomorrow morning will be December 1st, but we're right on average. Anywhere from the 28th of November to the 4th of December is when we see our first freeze. That is in San Antonio. Of course, much earlier, parts of the Hill Country, anywhere from Halloween to th- through the first week of November, Kerrville, Lakey, and about the Rock Springs area. So right now, ooh, look at this drop already. Fredericksburg 36, Kerrville 36. 
There are some areas where temperatures are falling off very quickly. Those are good examples there. 53 Catula, 52 Hondo in San Antonio, Uvalde now at 48. Tomorrow, I'm thinking low to mid 20s for a good chunk of the hill country, about 25 in Kerrville and Fredericksburg, maybe even a little cooler than that. And the freeze is going to last a little longer in the hill country. Everybody else, probably about four hours at and below freezing late tonight, particularly early tomorrow morning and some upper 20s out there. Of course, 28 Hondo, 29 Lackland area, Timberwood Park, 28 and Seguin about 28 degrees tomorrow morning. Things change as we get into Wednesday morning readings go back up into the 40s. So near average, but still jacket weather and then the temperatures fall off again. Those morning readings back down into the 30s, even flirting with freezing through the end of the work week and to kickstart the weekend. So this whole week is going to be running below average. The average low is 45 and we're going to be below that. Even the high temperatures going to be below average. One reason is the very dry air in place. Dew points in the teens right now. This means the air can cool off very efficiently, especially with our clear sky and calm wind combined with that very dry air. So temperatures fall off fast. If you're outdoors this evening, you'll definitely want a jacket as that temperature drops quickly. Quiet weather though. We don't have any precipitation to join the unseasonably cool temperatures, but they do actually some snow in northern Alabama this evening. I was looking at the observations there and confirmed light snow reported uh, later this afternoon and into the evening hours in northern Alabama. So it's pretty far south for that cold air to reach and of course the precip to accompany it around here tomorrow morning near 30 degrees at sunrise. Once that sun's up though, temperatures quickly spike by noon will be in the mid 50s and then into the afternoon lower 60s. So a lot of sunshine, low 60s, a beautiful day especially into the afternoon. Wednesday, another cold front hits. We'll still be in the 60s, but that sets the stage for cooler readings by Thursday and Friday. At that point, we're looking at mornings near freezing and then afternoon highs well into the or just into the 50s and not even hitting 60 degrees for Thursday and Friday in terms of those afternoon high temperatures we will be back to average by this upcoming weekend, particularly into Sunday at about 67 degrees for that afternoon. So it's going to be some time until we're back up uh, at average conditions around here. Hope all my potted plants like where I've placed them for the next <laughs> week. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. Because they're there. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. There. Good morning, Whoop. You had an awesome Thanksgiving weekend and got some shopping done. Shooting. Police tell us happened around 1130 last night in Vance Jackson near Jackson Keller, not far from Colonial Hills Elementary School. They say the man was in front of his apartment with two other men. When he went back inside, police say one of the men shot the victim through the sliding glass door. They say a bullet hit his arm and he was rushed to a hospital. Police are still looking for the shooter. A three week stay at home order begins today in Los Angeles County, where more than 5,000 cases were reported Sunday. People in the county are now being urged not to gather with anyone outside their household, even if it's outdoors. And on the south side, an argument ends with one person getting stabbed, another man's property being lit on fire. Police say the victim was at his mother's home when he got into an argument with the suspect. Officers say the suspect arrived at the home last night and was told to leave by both the mother and the victim. When he didn't, an argument broke out between the suspect and the victim, and that's when police say the suspect stabbed the victim before taking off. The victim then grabbed some of the suspect's belongings, which had been left behind, and lit them on fire in a nearby parking lot. So far, no one is facing any charges. As hospitals here in major Texas cities struggle, the news of a second vaccine going after FDA approval offers reason to celebrate. Both vaccines working 90 to 95 percent to stop COVID spike protein. Meanwhile, the Bear County Fire Marshal reminding people to keep warm safely tonight. The fire marshal says as cold weather arrives, they start to see an increase in house fires, so they're offering up some tips on how to avoid that situation. Make sure your space heater has an automatic shutoff and keep kids away from these heating objects as well. There were a lot of questions surrounding a large metal sculpture that appeared in a desert canyon in Utah. Like, where did it come from? Who put it there? How long has it been there? Well, here's a new one. Where did it go? State officials say they found out about its removal on Friday. 
There was a lot of interest about the sculpture, nicknamed the monolith, after it was discovered earlier this month, including from Utah's Bureau of Land Management. Installing the monolith apparently was illegal to do so there. They were looking into its origins and even showed off this picture, but they never revealed where it was. The monolith's removal just adding more to the mystery now. That story fascinates me. Mm -hmm. We got to find out. Ever heard of John Landis Mason? <laughs> Probably not, but you more than likely heard of his impact on home canning. He's the inventor of the mason jar, and today is National Mason Jar Day. The jars have made canning safer since the 1800s. Mason jars really changed the game with the way we store food, and home gardeners still can can their harvest in the same way, along with jellies, jams, and homemade pickles and salsas. Grandma always had a bunch in her basement. But uh, mason jars have gotten another use in the past few years as decorations and DIY projects. Misty Campbell Obert is the one who gets credit for National Mason Jar Day. She's founding, uh, founder of Unboxing the Bazaar. There you go. My grandmother had floor to ceiling cellar of mm -hmm. mason jars, canned green beans. She was ready for anything, she right? She was ready. That's I won't right. tell you what my uncles in Tennessee and <laughs> Kentucky did with mason jars. <laughs> yes. A freeze tomorrow morning. Get ready for it. Mm hmm. Well, there are so many things we could say. Have a good night. Good night.